Welcome back to the King's Podcast, The Wellness Diet with Lucky. I'm your host, Esther Lucky. Today we are joined by Dr. Trevor Files, consultant cardiothoracic surgeon here at King's, and he'll be taking us on a deep dive into open heart surgery and what might make you require open heart surgery, as well as introducing the new cardiothoracic unit here at King's College Hospital. Dr. Trevor, thank you for finding the time to join us here today. Yeah, thank you for having me. Delighted to be here. Thanks. So I'm going to start. We hear cardiac surgery, cardiothoracic surgery. What's the difference? Are they the same? Uh, probably the best way to look at it is that we have the thoracic cavity, and in the thoracic cavity, we have the heart and other structures. So cardiac surgery really means that we just look at the heart itself and operate on the heart and the structures within the heart. Mm -hmm. um, it encompasses surgery that could involve coronary artery disease or bypass surgery. Mm -hmm. And the sequelae of having coronary artery disease or ischemic heart disease. We then also have valvular component to it and um, different causes uh, can uh, help uh, develop, have, uh, have patients develop um, valvular heart disease. We can either repair the valves or replace them at the time of surgery uh, when indicated. The second, third subset would be patients that, that get arrhythmias. Most mm -hmm. commonly would be supraventricular arrhythmias. Mm -hmm. But there's now also a subset of patients that can get dysfunction from at the ventricular basis, which we can actually also address at the time of surgery, which is commonly associated with the form of mitral valve disease, uh, one of the valves of the heart. And the last category is infective processes of the heart. Sometimes we can get infections on the valves, which can make patients very sick. Mm -hmm. And once we stabilize them, the earlier we operate them, the better with certain organisms that can affect the heart valves. And there's also a subset that the lining of the heart or the pericardium can be involved. So that's the heart uh, in, in brief summary. Then, of course, we have the thoracic cavity. All right. Uh, and that's more thoracic surgery. So thoracic surgeons would co uh, concentrate on the on the lungs and diseases of the lung, for example, mm -hmm. lung cancers. Uh, we also have structures that go through the thoracic cavity from the head and neck to the body. Uh, there's the major vessel there, order. So we can get diseases in the descending thoracic order, which these days we mostly manage uh, by percutaneous methods. And of course, there's the gullet or the esophagus that can be managed. And then in the um, mediastinum, we have different um, um, tumors that can arise. Uh, most commonly would be thymic tumors or lymphomas that can affect those or can be diagnosed when it affects the uh, mediastinal structures. So we have cardiac, concentrating purely in the heart, and then thoracic, uh, looking at lungs and other structures in the thoracic cavity. Mm -hmm. And also the chest wall and chest wall problems can be dealt with, with by thoracic surgeons. All right, doctor. Thank you. So... Uh... What do you focus on? I know I've introduced you as a cardiothoracic surgeon. Yes, uh, well, my history is uh, once I um, immigrated to Australia, I had to make a choice between doing cardiac uh, or thoracics. And uh -huh. so I opted to do, to do cardiac. There are a few in Australia that do, they do both, but mostly um, surgeons would either concentrate on cardiac or thoracic. So I chose the cardiac pathway. So for the last 23 years, all I've done is cardiac surgery. Wow. No thoracic surgery. So mm -hmm. I was quite blessed to be exposed to a wide variety of issues regarding the heart. Okay. So uh, the last time I had uh, an interventional cardiologist here, Dr. Mahmoud Bhatt, I asked him if he can fix a broken heart. I'm going to throw the same question to you. Can you fix a broken <laughs> heart? <laughs> uh, yes, I I we can, particularly with structural heart disease or valvular heart disease. That's mm -hmm. something we can address really well. Uh, there's a component of a valve disease called degenerative valve disease or myxomatous valve disease involving a mitral valve, which we can repair with excellent outcomes and give patients very good long-term uh, results. Um, so that's a real broken issue where a cord can break and it is broken. Mm -hmm. um, other valves can be replaced if they if they degenerate. And lastly, bypass surgery. There's a form of bypass surgery that when we use arterial grafts, mm -hmm. uh, which are uh, arteries, uh, we can give patients significant survival benefit and that becomes evident between five and 20 years. Um, so in those subset of patients, if they're well selected, they can get excellent long-term outcome results. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. Other than broken hearts, what else can lead a patient or an individual to your clinic? Uh, well, usually patients uh, will find their way to a surgeon via cardiologist. So mm -hmm. we have a very important um, relationship uh, in the in the sense that they will see patients with symptoms and mm -hmm. work out exactly what is causing their problem. Um, if they can deal with it by interventional means, they will. Mm -hmm. So if they can stent coronaries, they'll do that. 
uh, but then there'll be a group of patients that really wouldn't benefit from stenting if it's a lot of stents that need to be placed or diabetics in particular. Mm -hmm. Uh, they'll be much better off long term with bypass surgery and of course then there's the valvular component and the arrhythmia section which we can deal with very well and successfully from a cardiac perspective. Patients cannot book a consultation with you directly, they have to come through interventional cardiology. Patients could but um, ideally it would be through a cardiologist if they've been worked up elsewhere and have a diagnosis and they need second opinion then we would welcome them very much to come and see us. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, if they haven't been worked up, we haven't had the investigations done appropriately. For example, I can't do angiography. Mm. And uh, in certain groups of patients over a certain age, we prefer angiography to CT methods of assessing coronary arteries. Mm -hmm. So in those patients, we prefer them to come via cardiology worked up with the diagnosis made so we can give them the appropriate information regarding their heart disease mm -hmm. and guide them as to what the best option of therapy would be for them. Uh, okay, uh, what about uh, emergency cardiac episodes? Yes, we do see those. Again, most of those will come through cardiology. Of mm -hmm. course, there's the traumatic component, uh, which surgeons will be involved with very early, um, whether they be you know, blunt chest injuries or penetrative chest injuries. We fortunately don't see much trauma in this country uh, from a violent point of view, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. But other countries, of course, there's a high incidence of uh, violent incident, um, encounters where patients could have stab wounds or gunshots to the chest. So those would be a subset of emergencies. Then, of course, there's the ischemic events or the coronary disease patients that present with acute anginal syndromes and chest pain and changes in the electrocardiogram, the ECG. Again, the cardiologist will be intimately involved in diagnosing their problem and we would mm -hmm. intervene if necessary. Um, there could also be patients that have arrhythmia incidences that can cause um, sudden death and if they have successfully resuscitated can make their way to the emergency department. Most of those will fall under cardiology mm -hmm. but if there's surgical means of uh, treating the patients if it's underlying coronary disease again we'd be involved in that. Mm -hmm. Let me shift the gears a little bit. Let's assume I'm a patient of yours and I've been referred to you by one of our interventional cardiologist for a broken heart condition. What are the steps? Take us through the process. Well, firstly, as you become my patient, I'd like to get to know you. I think it's important that we start the conversation at a level that you can see I'm interested you as a human being first and foremost. And so I'd like to know who you are, what you, how old you are and what you do. The one thing we can do, uh, I can ask a lady her age, which is very unusual. Yeah, but of course, you can <laughs> It's important to know that what your occupation is, you know, if you're married, you have children. Um, so we start off like that to make a patient understand that mm -hmm. really we care for you from that from that level onwards. Which you really do. Yeah. Yeah. And then we'll go through your symptoms and how you presented. Um, I think it's vitally important that every clinician takes a very extensive history. Mm -hmm. So we'll go into your family history, um, your medications you take, allergies. Um, any other habits that are important, exercise ex uh, and other disease processes. Mm -hmm. And from then onwards, you'd have a thorough examination. And then we'll put everything together by looking at your special investigations. And what we have, though, that we'll discuss with drawings and other aids to show you exactly where your problem is and how we can help you with the issue. Um, and then we'll discuss the operative approach and what means we have of doing it. Um, we will also go through the risks and benefits. I think it's uh, the age of informed consent and patients are smart, you know, they, they look up what they have and they want to know exactly what's involved. So mm -hmm. most of them will mm -hmm. come to you pretty well prepared, knowing what their pathology is and what they can expect. Mm -hmm. uh, and then lastly, we go through the recovery, what they can expect in hospital. We take them very carefully through the operative theatre approach, uh, the consent process. Um, first day post-op intensive care and then we guide them through the hospital stay mm -hmm. and then discharge them from there for follow-up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right so is there um, a timeline for all this? Uh, uh, depending oh. on the pa patient's pathology um, if they're more urgent we'll operate on patients as soon as possible once everybody understands the process mm -hmm. uh, but if it's uh, something that's elective patients can obviously say look I've want to go and sort this out first before I have my operation and then we can plan according to that. They really will be guided by exactly what the pathology is. Often patients need to go home and have a discussion with their family mm -hmm. and tell them what's ahead and what to expect and what they can expect. And then if they're comfortable with the whole process, come back to us so we can find a date to help them with their problem. So, Dr. When I was doing my research on you, I realized that you do minimally invasive cardiac surgery procedures. 
Yep. Uh, when I think about cardiac surgery, I'm just thinking open heart. So what are these uh, minimally invasive ones? Let's start with open heart. That's just a term that's used because we actually operate on the heart. So it doesn't really matter what approach you use. Mm -hmm. So you sometimes you don't actually open the heart? We, and sometimes we don't. Bypass surgery, we can you do the procedure without bypass uh, heart or the heart lung machine. Um, one of my colleagues at the VAM is an expert at that, doing off-pump bypass surgery, which is really beneficial. I do limited cases in that approach. But milling invasive surgery is directed really uh, two approaches. It can be done mostly uh, through the right side of the chest. We call it a right mini thoracotomy. Uh, mostly the valve, we would do valvular issues, which is the mitral or the tricuspid valve. Mm -hmm. We can also do benign tumors, uh, holes in the heart, and we can also do an ablation process, for, which is for arrhythmia surgery mm -hmm. at the time of, for example, fixing uh, the underlying mitral valve or tricuspid valve. And there's an approach to the aortic valve called right anterior thoracotomy, uh, which I think is quite a difficult procedure. I've done a few of them. I prefer to do what is known as an upper hemistenotomy. It's a very limited incision over the midline. Uh, we don't open the breastbone all the way. It's a stable lower thorax, so patients still have the benefits of a much smaller incision. Mm -hmm. The drawback is we have to use the heart lung machine, um, and that makes, you know, it takes patients a while to recover from that. But having a smaller incision with less trauma, patients mm -hmm. recover a lot quicker. So um, from what I understand, uh, heart conditions are mostly caused by lifestyle. Uh, how somebody lives, you know, sedentary lifestyles, but diets and all that. To maintain a healthy heart, can, can some of these conditions that you're trying to treat be prevented? Yes, um, but sadly, once we have patients with diagnosed, for example, coronary disease is, uh, is most common what we refer to. Um, obviously, once they have established coronary disease, it's a bit difficult to... Um, reverse the procedure, we can certainly slow it down with more modern medication, particularly with lipid therapy mm -hmm. and looking at monoclonal antibodies, which do an amazing job, amazing job on these lesions. But in general, patients with that have developed coronary disease um, either have a genetic predisposition, which they can't change, or certainly contributed themselves by, as you mentioned, a sedentary lifestyle, um, obesity, uh, and with that often comes diabetes, which mm -hmm. is type 2 type, which is non-insulin dependent type diabetes. Um, and they often, because of their uh, eating habits, will have high lipids if they eat fatty foods and their cholesterol goes up. And of course, if they smoke socially, that doesn't benefit the heart. High alcohol intake can affect heart function uh, as well. So certainly uh, patients can contribute uh, to their um, development of heart disease. Once we diagnose it, uh, part of the whole rehab program is to reverse that and, you know, manage their high blood pressure, which they often will have, their diabetes, really mm -hmm. make sure we keep those levels well controlled. The lipid therapy is vitally important. And then we combine it, combine it with a form of um, uh, therapy to thin the blood a bit, usually aspirin or a combination thereof, uh, uh, to help them not uh, get further problems with clot formation in the mm -hmm. heart. Mm -hmm. So it's a whole spectrum and it's very important even post-surgery that cardiology be involved in managing mm -hmm. these patients very aggressively mm -hmm. because there's data to support that in the post-surgery if patients are very well managed from a cardiology perspective, mm -hmm. they do even better long-term. Mm -hmm. So it's a whole spectrum and it's a real team effort to make sure we look after these patients long-term. All right, doctor. Speaking of team effort, can you uh, tell us, give us a lowdown of uh, the cardiothoracic unit here at Kings? Certainly is a team effort, um, and I think we can address that from multiple views. Firstly, um, we need cardiology uh, on board, and with them we have MDTs where we discuss patients and possibility of surgery. And if you, if, if you like, we go through the history and what they have. We can have other specialty groups involved in making decisions and help us manage the patients post-operatively. But so it's a team effort to get these patients to surgery. The surgeons obviously will decide what is the best form of, of treatment once we decide the patient is for surgery. Um, but it starts really from a ward level, a pre-op level, mm -hmm. with nursing staff involved, uh, education programs, us seeing the patients, consenting them, guiding them through the whole process. Of course, we have in theater, a whole other team from an aesthetic team, and the cardiac anesthetist is vital. If we have the heart-lung machine, we have a perfusionist who does the heart-lung machine for us. Mm -hmm. And vitally important, the nursing staff to understand what cardiac surgery is and how we do it and what we require. 
but everybody in theatre, even the cleaners are important. I think it's important we remember everybody for mm -hmm. the that help us, you know, give patients a safe journey. Then it's intensive care and everybody involved in ICU and then step down to the ward. Um, we will see the patients on a daily basis and welcome people from cardiology if we need it or other disciplines. Uh, if there are unusual complications, we feel that should be addressed. Mm -hmm. And then obviously once the patient is discharged, rehab is vitally important and people involved in the rehab program. Also specific cardiac rehab, that is again to modify lifestyle and uh, limit the risk factors. And then we follow up patients on an annual basis to make sure they do well. <laughs> so you keep the relationship going for years? Absolutely, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, that's like a lifetime of friendship. <laughs> Almost, yes. Almost like family. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, doctor, before we let you go, do you have a rough idea of how many cases have come across your desk? Actually, I looked at my, the numbers I've done in my career, and I was actually quite surprised. I'm very blessed, and I can tell you that I've done over 5,000 open heart operations. Mm -hmm. And I'm struggling to get data because databases didn't really exist in the early and mid nineties. How many, how many years have you practiced? I've been in cardiac surgery since 1999. Wow. That's... Actually, no, 93, I qualified in South Africa. So I rephrased that since 93, I've been in cardiac surgery. That's a long time. That's a long time. So it's a I'm very blessed. It's a, a, a specialty that you um, learn and numbers unfortunately play a very important role in remembering how to do something and how to do it well mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so um, having exposure is vitally important so from that perspective I'm extremely lucky. Is there one particular case that has stayed with you through the years? Yes actually it happened to be a transplant a uh, cardiac transplant we did um, this patient had an assist device in uh, which I had to put in because he was deteriorating and we Eventually got a donor heart. Um, he was the first assist device we put in at Prince Charles in Brisbane in Australia. Mm -hmm. And we successfully bridged him to transplant and seeing a man dying and then keeping him alive with an assist device. And within five weeks, we had a donor organ wow. and everything went extremely well. And seeing him go from virtually dead to walking out of hospital alive and long term follow being excellent is something that I remember for a long, long time. Oh, that's amazing. I can imagine that uh, it's like the highlight of your career. That and others, yes. <laughs> yeah, that and others, of course. <laughs> okay, Dr. Trevor, it was a pleasure having you here. Until next time. That's an honor. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> well, Dr. Trevor Baez, consultant cardiothoracic surgeon here at Kings. Until next time, bye.